Do I get my image up? There it is. Well, I'm, I'm glad the Pepsi has been removed because being from Atlanta, I cannot be on the same stage with a <laughs> Pepsi product. <laughs> I will try to convince you today that you're basically apes. Now, you, you may be walking on two legs, which is the main difference in my opinion, but otherwise there's a lot of similarity. And the topics I want to go over is social behavior. That's the sort of thing that I study. I want to go over peacemaking, which has, uh, is a long time interest of me, uh, power relationships, reciprocity. We do lots of studies on that, and fairness principles. And, and in order to keep your attention, I'll in throw in occasional <laughs> political satire a little bit, not too much, because it's so easy to do. So first, let me say a few things about um, peacemaking, reconciliation, that kind of issues. Uh, something that I discovered in the 1970s and, and has become, uh, at least in animal behavior, a big area. Surprisingly, it's a much bigger area in animal behavior than in human behavior. There's very little studies on human peacemaking. But what we discovered um, is if, if there's a fight between two primates, this is, this is after a fight between two adult male chimpanzees, um, it, it's not just that they separate, but they come together. These males are now together sitting in a tree, and about 10 minutes after the fight, one of them holds out a hand and invites the other for a contact. And about a second after I took this picture, they came together in the fork of the tree, and they kissed and embraced each other. And then they climbed out of the tree, and they groomed each other on the ground. And, and that whole process is called a reconciliation. It's, of course, a very recognizable process for us. I'll give you another example. This is a fight between a male and a female chimpanzee. Uh, the female comes back with some submissive grunts to the male. The female offers her hand for a hand kiss to the male. That's where our hand kiss comes from. No, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's a way of testing uh, the mood that the male is in, a very effective way, of course. Um, and then they proceed to a mouse-to-mouse -mouse kiss, which is the typical way of reconciliation uh, among chimpanzees. So it's a very interesting process. It can be objectively defined. It can be objectively measured. So here you see um, how we measure that actively in primates, post-conflict observations. We do after a fight, we do an observation, uh, and we do control observations. And this is uh, a graph on one particular species where you see that 60% of the individuals come together in a friendly way after a fight, uh, and, and in the control observations, about 20%, 25%. What this means is exactly the opposite of what I learned when I was a student. I learned that aggression is a dispersive mechanism. Aggression creates space between individuals, which is a very logical way of putting it for territorial animals, where indeed that's the case. But what you see here is that actually after aggression there's more contact, far more contact between individuals. So actually aggression attracts individuals and brings them together. All the animals have different ways of doing this. Uh, <laughs> this, this is called the hold bottom ritual. It's done among stumptail monkeys where one of them presents, the other one holds the hips and inspects that individual. Bonobos do it with sex, bonobos do everything with sex, so why not reconciliation? And so they, they come together after fights and they have some genital rubbing or some sexual interaction between them. And, and now, uh, in the meantime, reconciliation has been found in all sorts of mammals, usually cooperative mammals. And so it's a very widespread phenomenon, actually. Uh, the only animal that has been tested where they have not found it, and, and people who have those animals in the home, they will understand that, is the domestic cat. The domestic cat has no reconciliation. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> All other animals that have been tested. And so there's, there's a whole range of studies on these peacemaking mechanisms. And these peacemaking uh, ways, they, they are actually a mechanism to keep societies together despite internal conflict. So it's a, it's a primary mechanism. It's absolutely essential. Uh, I think it's very interesting, uh, since I started out in the time that Conrad Lawrence and aggression was so important, to find these sort of opposing mechanisms that help control aggression. And it's not only at the group level. Uh, anyone who's married knows that reconciliations are necessary, children are necessary. So in human society, it's an absolutely critical mechanism as well. If you measure it in children, you get exactly the same sort of data. There's now many studies where the primate observation techniques have been applied to children in the schoolyard, and we did the same thing. You get the same sort of graphs, and so you get the same sort of mechanism. Now, adult humans do it slightly different. We don't necessarily kiss and embrace or have sex necessarily with colleagues or something like that. But um, we do have the, the whole mechanism down. So let me say a few things about strategic reconciliation. 
people always think that reconciliation is beautiful because it, it has forgiveness in it and all of this, and then so they think it's, it's always a sort of nice process. But I think it can be very cynical and very strategic. And so, uh, especially in politics, that's a very important part of reconciliation. And so let me describe a typical chimpanzee example. Here you have a coalition of chimpanzees, one, two, three. Uh, chimpanzees form coalitions, and so the power of an individual never depends on his own personal power, always depends on who your supporters are. And so you get this kind of politics where, in this case, you have an adult male. This male is Nicky. He is dependent on the old male, who's twice as old as he. he Nicky's about 17 years old. And so he's the alpha male, but it's the old male who put him in that position, basically, the kingmaker of Nikki. And this is the third male who is individually stronger than either one of them. And we know that because in captivity you can get animals in situations where they're only one-on-one. -on -one. And this is the strongest male, but he cannot handle the coalition. And so Nikki's power is completely de dependent on Jeroen, which means that he needs to stay friends with Jeroen, the old male. Otherwise, he's gone. And so you get this sort of situation. Here you see the two males the old male and the young male, together threatening the third male. And, and you can see how intimidating this can be. And so uh, Nikki is the alpha male, as long as he has a tie with Jeroen, the old male. But sometimes they get into fights, usually over females. So sometimes the two coalition partners don't get along. And they have a big fight between them. As soon as that happens, the third male grows in size, put up all his hair, starts intimidating everyone, throwing rocks around and everything, uh, and becomes basically the dominant male for that short moment. Because they cannot handle, them, handle him when they are fighting among themselves. So in the middle of the fight, Nikki, the highest ranking male, has to beg for a reconciliation. He basically grovels on, on the ground with his hand held out to the old male to get a reconciliation. And as soon as a reconciliation occurs, they put together that other male into place. So that's what I mean by a strategic reconciliation. It's a, it's a reconciliation that is dictated by the political environment where you need a particular partner. And chimpanzees are smart enough to understand that if they don't have these reconciliations, the partnership is gone and their position is gone. In human politics, that's a very common process. And, and I want to tell you something about the Bush-McCain reconciliation. Uh, of course, after the primaries in the US, you see these reconciliations all the time between Dean and Kerry and whatever kind of people we have. And so Bush and McCain, they had this very sharp debate. They had very nasty campaigns against each other with, with lots of lies and everything. Not that that's unusual, but uh, we've seen that recently again. But um, it was a very bad situation. But at some point, after Bush won, they had to reconcile. <laughs> and so they had a reconciliation. Uh, and it was depicted in the media as a very painful one. So, so here, McCain says, what is his hand doing on my shoulder? And he is saying, how embarrassing. And it was the, the most awkward sort of reconciliation I've ever seen on TV. Because they asked McCain, did you forgive Bush? And McCain repeated three times in a row. And, and everyone was laughing when he did so. He said, I endorse Governor Bush. I endorse Governor Bush. And so he, he didn't want to use the word forgiveness, and I think that's still probably the case. So we have these strategic reconciliations that are based on the maintenance of a relationship, and there's not necessarily a lot of nice feeling involved. So let me say a few things about power relationships in uh, chimpanzees and humans. In, in chimpanzees, the, the power relationship is expressed in very clear body language. The male on the left is the dominant. The male on the right is exactly the same size in terms of weight. Um, but he looks smaller because he makes himself look smaller. This one has his hair up, walks bipedally, has a stick in his hand. And so that's the intimidation process. And so there's a very clear body language about who is dominant and who is subordinate. Chimpanzees have. I need sound for this particular one, so turn up the sound. Chimpanzees have a vocalization. It's called the pant grunt, which indicates that you're supporting it. And so you can see a female here on the left doing it to a male on the right. And I'll play this one. And then she bows, and he walks over her. And so that's the process of indicating who's dominant and who's subordinate. This is done on a very regular, regular basis among chimpanzees. And uh, if, if there's a failure of this pant grunting, if a subordinate doesn't show submission in this particular way, 
then all hell breaks loose because that means that the hierarchy is unstable and needs to be uh, settled and established. Uh, the males have a very intimidating dominance display. You will see here one that I shot recently in the field. You see a male here. He's going to be approached by someone. Then you see him swaggering, putting his hair up, swaggering. And then he makes a random charge into the bushes. Now, anyone who doesn't go out of the way when he does that charge is in deep trouble. So, so he does this random charge to just show that he's the boss here. Now he sways. <laughs> okay, lots of noise. We're very used to that in primatology, so you maybe not. <laughs> Apart from being dominant and having all these indications of who's dominant and who's subordinate, the dominant individuals have certain tasks in the community, and the most important one is what we call the control role, which is sort of arbiter ta task or judgment task. And so here, what you have here is a, a, a female here and a female there who got into a screaming match between each other, so they got into a fight, and this male, the alpha male, has come in and he stops them, and he stands between them, and he stops the fight. And so alpha males have this tendency of breaking up fights and keeping the peace in the group, and if they're good at that, we call them good leaders, and they become very popular in the group if they're good at that. And, and so they change their behavior. If, if this is a male over time, and this is the years that he was alpha male, you see he changes from winner supporter to loser supporter. He, he mostly, when he is not in the highest ranking position, he stirs up a lot of trouble in the group, and he helps his buddies, and he helps them beat up others. And so he's a winner supporter. But when he's an alpha male, he comes up for the underdog. He defends the weak parties in the group. And the better and more effective he is at that, the more everyone will like him which gives him a stable position, because at times of crisis, when he's being challenged, the whole group will stand up for him, because he's the guy that they want to keep. So, so it's almost like a democratic process here. Um, and and I've, over the time I've worked for, for 30 years now with chimpanzees, I've seen many different uh, leaders, and there's basically two kinds of leaders. Um, this is a sort of male, uh, but what all males need to do in the top position is suppress the ones right below them. So the males who can take potentially their position, who are physically capable of doing so, you need to keep them down. And so they do need to be quite suppressive. They can be friends with them, but they need to be very hard with them. Then you have two kinds of leaders. The leaders who are bullies, basically, and suppress everyone else as well. So, so they're physically very intimidating males, usually, who suppress everybody. And they attack everybody. They're not kind, necessarily, with anybody. Uh, and the populists, I would call them, who support, who are very effective leaders, they support the weak in society, the females and the juveniles, and they make sure that they are not being hurt by someone else. And as a result, they get support back from them, and this stabilizes their position. It's a very interesting process. Machiavelli already talked about it, that it's better to become prince with the assistance of the common people because you get a more stable position out of it. And, and so I think it, it is sort of the beginnings of democracy there, is that if you are a good, effective leader, you're in that powerful position. Uh, if you use that position to the benefit of many in the society, uh, they will want to keep you. Now, human politics is sometimes described to me by social scientists as very different because it's non-physical. Now, I don't know what they're talking about. They're probably talking about very recent history uh, because... Um, it, it used to be very physical, and I think it, it is still very physical. We just went through three presidential debates where you basically could turn off the TV. You didn't uh, turn off the sound of the TV. You didn't need to hear what these people were saying because they're, they're lying to you anyway. Uh, <laughs> but if the body language was right there in front of you and was very clear. So uh, when people decided that Kerry had won the debates, uh, I don't think they needed to listen to see that necessarily. And, and that... Uh, that our politics is not physical, if you look at recent democracies, like in Korea and Japan, there's lots of physical stuff going on. It's very interesting, actually. And I hear that, uh, for example, the, the Commons, the, the Chamber of Commons in the UK, still keeps the two parties two sword lengths apart from each other. Um, this is in, in South Korea. Uh, is, did this stop playing all of a sudden? Well, this is a sort of a good one. I like that one. It's, uh, <laughs> 
So when people say that our politics is non, not physical, it used to be very physical, and I think it very often still is. And I heard recently that in, in Congress there was also some intimidation between male members going on. And, and in, in human body language, there's really no question who's the dominant male in this particular case. Uh, there's no question who's the dominant male in this particular case. And so our body language is extremely clear in this. And there are recent studies that are very interesting on human voice patterns. We produce very low hums in our voice that you are not conscious of and that you cannot consciously hear, but that communicate status differences between people. And so even if you're on the phone with your boss, you talk differently than when you're on the phone with one of your employees. And, and this has all been tested out. And so we have many ways of communicating status, which I think I always need to bring to the attention of the social scientists. Because since I'm a biologist working in the psychology department, I get all these textbooks on social psychology. And I always look, the first thing I do is I look in the back in the index what they say about power and dominance, because they never mention it. The social sciences don't believe that we have power relationships, and they don't believe that we have dominance relationships. Which for me is very puzzling, because I see them all the time around me and very clear. So who's the alpha male here, for example? <laughs> So, so I told you this story about Nikki. Uh, I told you the story about Nikki with the old male. The old males in, in chimpanzee politics have a very interesting role. The old males play young guys off against each other and side one day with the one and the other day with the other, and they become very powerful as a result. And so here we have Bush with his two old males, and, and it's basically the same sort of pattern where the old males are over the hill, they're not necessarily in a position anymore that they can take the alpha spot, but they can wield an enormous amount of power. And in that sense, that's really not that much difference with chimpanzee politics. Now, we also are very sensitive to the stature for some reason, we're still very sensitive to these physical attributes of leaders, whether they're tall or short. And Berlusconi is very famous for being very upset about his shortness. He's not that short, he's a bit like Danny DeVito or something. But um, <laughs> he's, he's very upset about that. And so when he poses with Bush, he all of a sudden knows how to erase the difference. You see, there's a much smaller difference here. And this is very well known. Uh, here you see Bush with his good friend Jacques Chirac. Um, who seems to be explaining that he should be paying more attention to the guy upstairs, maybe. And when Bush poses with Chirac, the difference is all of a sudden gone. And so leaders do this all the time. They're very conscious of this. This is probably the most striking one I could find, um, because a Fox is uh, one head taller than Bush. So how does Bush end up here? With but you see, he is still slightly taller in the photograph, and in, in exploring this issue on the, on the web, I have found that they never reverse the order. So, so they can bring up a shorty up to the tall leader, but they never reverse the order. That must be a way of avoiding uh, an arms race of, of uh, stature, because um, as soon as you start reversing the order, then, then all bets are off probably where you put people. So, so much for political leaders. And now I want to say a few things about reciprocity and fairness which are issues that we're testing out at the moment. And uh, we do a lot of studies on reciprocity in primates, reciprocity being defined that you do favors for each other, with a time delay between the favors and a contingency between giving and receiving. And, and that sort of things can be easily tested out. In the field of, for example, chimpanzees hunt. This is a monkey that they have hunted down. They share the meat. And we know that they share preferentially with other hunters. And so uh, even the highest ranking male, if he has not been part of the hunting party, he will have to beg for his food. He will not necessarily get it from the hunters. So in that sense, there's reciprocity. And if you have joint action, you, you need to have joint payoffs. Otherwise, joint action will never work. And this is a very important principle, because this is the basis of the fairness principle that I will get to, is that in order to have Cooperation within the society, you have to have some sort of fair distribution of the payoffs of the cooperation. So we test, for example, our chimpanzees on food sharing. Uh, we give them a, a watermelon, and we see how they share it. This is the alpha male of the group here, who has to beg for his food. A female is owning it. Uh, as soon as chimpanzees go into food sharing, they sort of cancel the hierarchy. The hierarchy doesn't really matter that much anymore. It's regulated by other processes, such as reciprocity. And so even the highest ranking male cannot simply take the food from that female. She, she will go in a screaming tantrum if that happens, and, and the whole group will go after him. He cannot do that. 
So here we have uh, a typical sharing session. We provide them with food. And sometimes individuals don't share, like this very stingy female who keeps all the food. And so all we do is measure who approaches whom, who has food, and how often do they get food from that individual. And sometimes they get nothing, and sometimes they get something. And then the second currency that we use is grooming, which is something that primates do all the time. And so we measure grooming in the morning. In the morning, we measure among our chimpanzees who grooms whom and for how long. Then we wait a couple of hours, then we introduce food, and then we see who shares with whom. And of course, you can correlate those two uh, over a time span. And, and we did this for about 7,000 food interactions. And I'm not going to bother you with the details of the statistics, but basically comes out of it. If A grooms B, there's an increased tendency of B to share food with A. And it is specific for this interaction, B's tendency towards anybody else is not affected by this. It is specifically towards the one who did the grooming that the food sharing occurs over a time interval of two hours. Which means two things. It means memory, so that uh, B remembers that she was being groomed by A. Uh, and it means, of course, something that in humans we call gratitude, a, a coloring of that memory in a positive sense which makes you act more posit positively towards that individual. And so I think chimpanzees have that whole memory and gratitude mechanism down that is involved in reciprocity. We did the same sort of studies on brown capuchin monkeys, very favorite type of monkey for me. They're much smaller and in that sense much easier to work with than chimpanzees, but they have, they're very smart, they have very large brains uh, for, for most monkeys. And I'll show you a little video here of uh, capuchins doing nutcracking in the field. Uh, but you see how small they are. We usually say that they have a convergent evolution with chimpanzees in the sense they have large brains, they use tools, they have coalitions, uh, and they share food. I'll get to that. They hunt collectively like chimpanzees. So there are many parallels, even though it's clearly a monkey, not an ape, uh, and has a tail by which it can even hang and all of this, which chimpanzees and us don't have. So some of the experiments we do is we bring two monkeys they, they normally live in the social group. We take them out of the group. We put them in a test chamber like this. We put mesh between the two, and we give one of them an attractive food, and we see how they share the food. And, and you can then switch foods back and forth and see whether there's reciprocity between them. I'll show you just one little video of a, a male on the left who's going to give some of his food to the female. The female is reaching through to get his food, but he also, he's also going to give her some. So that's an active give, and, and it shows how extremely tolerant these monkeys are and how suitable they are for the sort of experiments that we do. And the final experiment that I want to explain to you <laughs> is an experiment on fairness that we just recently, uh, with Sarah Brosnan, we got a lot of attention for it because it came out last year. And, <laughs> and actually, when it came out, the New York Times, they were in the middle of this Grasso affair in New York, and so they were comparing Grasso, who was taking so much for himself, uh, to my monkeys who were sensitive to that. <laughs> so here we have uh, the, the typical task that we do is um, we, we give a token like a pebble. We throw a pebble in the test chamber with the monkey. The monkey has to hand the pebble back to us. As soon as that hap happens, they get a reward. And so that's a very simple task for a capuchin monkey. Um, it sounds also very simple. There's many monkeys who would not, you, you can throw rocks, you can give them rocks, you will never get them back from them. But since capuchins have a sort of understanding of this give and take and share food themselves, they, they can easily be trained to do this. Now, once you have done this, we train them on cucumber pieces. You can give them different rewards. And so you can put two monkeys side by side, you give one of them grapes for this task, and the other one you give cucumber slices for this task. Now guess which one is more attractive? Uh, my capuchins have a preference for food which corresponds 100% with the prices in the supermarket. <laughs> and so this is a far better kind of food. So they, they compare and we compare, so to speak. And if you do that for two monkeys, and you give both of them cucumber, here, here you actually see the task. Here she's returning a rock to our hand and another monkey is watching up close, and this monkey will be in the next exchange. I'll show you a little video of it. So if you give both of them cucumber, there's about a 5% rejection rate, meaning that 95% of the time, the monkeys are happy to exchange if you give both of them cucumber. 95% of, so basically all the time. If one of them gets cucumber, but the neighbor is getting grape, 
the rejections go up to about 50%. So 50% of the time, the monkey who's getting only cucumber uh, doesn't want to perform, throws the cucumber out of the cage, <laughs> throws the rock out of the cage, is refusing this task. And if you give the other one grape without any effort, so now we're not even asking to exchange, we're just giving the other one grapes, the, the rejections go up to 80%. So now we don't want to do this task anymore because the other one is getting grapes for nothing. <laughs> and so I'll show you a little video of this. The video um, has a soundtrack, maybe, um, why don't you turn off the sound? And I'll play it and I'll just explain it. The equity test is where both get cucumber. So um, here you have Sarah giving a piece of cucumber to this monkey on the right, then uh, getting the rock back from the one on the left, giving a piece of cucumber, then she walks around again, does the same thing to this one, and you can do that 25 times in a row and they will, without any problem, do it because cucumber is actually quite good food, you know, it's not bad at all. So now we have a situation where the one on the right is getting, uh, giving the rock back, getting a grape, here are the grapes, you're getting a grape, okay. The, the food is in full view, now this one gives a rock back, she gets cucumber. Now look at what she does with it. There it goes. <laughs> it's, yeah. Now this one gets a grape, gets a grape again. This one gets a cucumber. Now she's going to drop it, I believe. Yeah, here it is. It's on the, on the, now look at the other one, what the other one is going to do. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this one gets a great, now this one is sitting in the corner now, doesn't want to do anything anymore <laughs> and has lost interest in the task. <laughs> so now the, there's two things I want to say, I have, I have one minute to say two things about this, this particular experiment. One is that it fits with the theories of a new field in economics, which is called behavioral economics, which just two years ago uh, the two founders got Nobel Prizes which is a field that doesn't look at the, at the abstract market forces of economics, but says human nature is involved, human emotions are involved, many of these evolved tendencies are there. And so to reject unequal pay, for example, is in the short range an irrational response, because you should take anything you get. These monkeys should take cucumber if they can get cucumber. That would be rational maximizing. But both people and monkeys don't react that way. We are not rational maximizers. And there's a whole field of economics that argues that in the long run to build a cooperative society you should be sensitive, not being short-changed. And so you should be sensitive to this sort of issues. And the same argument uh, we can follow for these capuchin monkeys. We think that since they live in societies where there needs to be joint payment for joint efforts, you need to keep an eye on what you get compared to what others get, and you need to be sensitive to that, and you need to show these sort of irrational responses to maintain a cooperative system. And the second thing I want to say about that, if you look at the Gini index of uh, countries, which is the way economists measure the, the income disparity between nations, uh, the U.S. is sort of a very uh, exceptional nation in that its Gini index is, is among the third world nations uh, as compared to, for example, Europe and Japan, which have much lower Gini indices. And so if you want to have a cooperative society in which everyone contributes and gets something out of it and uh, makes a living out of it, uh, you probably need to pay attention to issues of fairness because even monkeys, as you can see, have issues of fairness that they're sensitive to. And I thank all the people who work with me and I thank you as well.